Hey everybody, what's going on? It's episode 135, Tone Talk with Mark Uzanski and Dave Friedman. Uh, tonight we've got James Finnerty of Rewind Electric. And uh, James makes awesome pickups and also wrote a book called uh, Gibson PAF Humbucking Pickup from Myth to Reality. Make sure you guys check out that book. We'll be talking about it tonight during the show. Um, James, thanks for coming on. How are you? Uh, I'm very well. Thank you for having me. Um, I should just say to both of you, first off, uh, it's a great honor. You know, I probably have no place here in guests among uh, Jakey Lee and Bob Rock and, you know, <laughs> all, the, all the wonderful folks you've had on. But I, I sure appreciate you, including uh, James from the desert who plays with pickups along with all these heroes of mine. Hey, man. Thank that. Thank you. No, I, I, that's awesome. Appreciate. Yeah, where it. where are you located, James? Uh, so I'm in like the very southwest corner of Utah. So I'm about 20 minutes from both Arizona and Nevada. I'm about two oh. hours east of Las Vegas. Is okay. Six hours south of Salt Lake. I'm much closer to Vegas. So I'm at uh, just the opposite end of the Mojave from you. Oh, cool. That's a cool area. I've never never been. I mean, I've been to Vegas, but. It's it's similar. It's it's ever so slightly cooler, but not much. It, it's about the same temperature. But I'm How also yeah. But I am 20 minutes away from the mountains, so I can stand under a palm tree, sipping a drink, wearing shorts, and I can see the snow on the mountains. And if I want to go play in it, it's only 20 30 minutes away. I I prefer that much more than shoveling it off my truck, as used to be the case in uh, Colorado Springs, and then back on the East Coast where I'm from. Right. Right. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> I used to live in, in the Northeast. So, uh, oh, wow. Someone said, I, I'm looking fit. I'll take it. Thank you. I'm alive. <laughs> I'm alive. So <laughs> that that that's a, a good start. Um, any relation to Pat Finnerty? Someone wants to know. I don't know. I mean, my middle name is Patrick. Uh, maybe. So uh, I'm related to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who Pat Finnerty is, but no, I don't know. So, well, that's awesome. Hey, let's, uh, before we get started, let, we want to talk about our sponsor, uh, Sweetwater. And Sweetwater is one of the sponsors of our show. We are, we have an affiliate link if you click in the description below the video. So if you click on that, and purchase anything then we get a little kickback from them a little commission um also i'd like to uh share my screen if i can um and go to this page right here that you guys can see make sure you check out sweetwater's guitar gallery um really why would you buy any guitar anywhere else um Sweetwater has a 55 point inspection. So uh, if you guys have ever bought a guitar from Sweetwater, if your guitar doesn't arrive it, with all of these things checked off and, and perfect, then, you know, contact them and they will, con they will take care of you. So, uh, and then you click here and you can shop their guitar gallery um, and really see all their guitars and all, all the different um, categories of electric guitars, acoustic guitars, bass guitars, whatever you want to buy from them. Um, they do so, great pictures also. Yeah, exactly. That's the other thing. So if you wanted to click on, say, any particular brand of guitars, uh, let's check out eight string guitars because, you know, uh, that's going to be my next thing. I'm going to start playing eight string guitars. Just All right. Kidding. I'm just totally kidding. I don't have enough. Are you gonna go? That. Are you gonna go for uh, this black shit, black color? Or are you gonna go for the green? <laughs> uh, I don't know what I'm going for. <laughs> I, couldn't, <laughs> I, I couldn't play for either one of these. But you get to see the, the the point though. Like they take pictures, really great pictures of the guitar that you, the actual guitar that you're getting. Yeah, so, it has a serial number, exact serial number of the right. exact guitar you're getting. So. That's right. a real nice draw. See the weight yeah. and everything. That's cool. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Well, they try to give you all the details since you're you're not an in-person buyer. You know, and uh and that's great. I'm not making you pickups for that, Mark. Sorry. Oh <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that would be I think that would be 
kind of tough. But here, like, I mean, when when you start talking about expensive guitars, right, um, and you really want to look at the top that you're getting, what's that top going to look like when I get it at home? You know, that's that's important. At least sure. for me. You know, like you want to get good angles on it and understand, you know, what it's going to look like. So yeah, uh, you guys check out check out Sweetwater's uh, guitar gallery. Okay, so just wanted to mention that, and then also check out fixpedalboards.com. dot com. Uh, our friend over at fixpedalboards.com dot com is Tim, and he's got all kinds of upgrades for your pedal boards. And the new junk boxes are out, which are, well, junction boxes. Oh, gotcha. They're just called junk box, though. Junk box two, four, six, uh, you know, stacked, all sorts of things for your pedal board interface needs, you know. Super cool. Really, cool. Dura really durable and well done. Good stuff. I have to check it out. I think I looked at it last time. I can't remember. Yeah, I think they were up last time, but I know for a fact the circuit boards are there and they're actually making them. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Cool. Very good. Um, all right, cool. Well, thanks uh, to Sweetwater and, and to Tim over at Fixed Pedal Boards. Make sure you guys check them out. Thank you, all Tim. Right. And James. Yes, sir. So, Rewind. Um, when did you start Rewind? When did that business start? Uh, February 2012, I registered the name. So I, it had been uh, something I was tinkering around with a little bit. That's and a good name. I was going to say, I was about to say that. It's a very good name. Do you, do you want to know the stupid, simple truth of where that came from? Sure. You got a broken pickup. What do you Google? Rewind, Rewind. electric guitar pickups. Yep. Yeah. Nobody knew who I was, and I was the first two pages of Google for years. <laughs> And that's I got why I said it's a great name. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is. <laughs> yeah, it really it, it worked out, and um, it, I think it it just kind of fits what I what I do in in all aspects of the various kinds of work, and whether it's you know guitars or amps or whatever. I'm sort of into the the older ways of doing things, so you know, rewind sort of isn't like taking you back to the past as well. I, not that yeah. I don't like modern stuff, but that's kind of the core, at least of the company image i think mm -hmm. yeah it's super cool yep yep you Very stole cool. it <laughs> so i uh i kind of fell into it accidentally I, i've worked with pickups but i've worked with musical instruments and electronic sound of all sorts for a long time uh through different dealers through studios of uh, as tech and engineer um i worked for a, a vintage collector up in new york for a while worked for a couple um, really skilled luthiers, which had two very different backgrounds between the two of them. So uh, the pickups was something that I just was kind of, I tried doing it for myself as yeah. I was buying stuff and not really finding what I wanted. Having, I'd been exposed to all these very nice instruments um, throughout those different positions I'd worked in, whether it was in stores or studios or whatnot, I got to be around and handle all these really cool, sounding guitars and i sort of had a personal draw towards old gibsons and i wasn't really finding what i wanted in modern instruments and modern electronics and it wasn't that it wasn't close and that there wasn't a lot of great options out there but it just wasn't quite what i had in my my spoiled memory from playing that stuff so i started just kind of thinking you know i have uh some coil winders that i was doing stuff like like little inductors and microphone trans little audio transformers with and i'm kind of a mechanically and electrically inclined person i was like well why don't i just try it you know how how hard can it be well, i mean it can be pretty hard i guess but <laughs> 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 i uh i built a few pickups that i was moderately happy with and i i sent them to my buddy jordan who um we used to work together at a music store and he um he and i shared similar tastes in music and he had moved to texas um we hadn't worked together in a few years but i said hey you know I, i'm kind of liking these what do you think and he's a really good player much better player than i am i was like why don't you give him a spin and i didn't know it but he had uh he had married a woman who was a videographer 
And so he put together a, a video, a couple, and put them up on YouTube. And uh, I started getting calls and or, or messages and emails at least saying, "Yeah, hey, how much are your pickups? I can't find them anywhere. Where's your website?" And you know, after a, a few times of saying, "I'm sorry, I, I don't sell them," I wised up and was like. Two hundred dollars, and <laughs> it, it, it just kind of snowballed from there. To be honest, uh, if I um, I laugh because I, I look back now and I think something as simple as a transducer has held my interest for you know going to twelve years now, and that's not really like me. And I I usually have kind of a short attention span on things. I'll I'll learn about a thing that I have on my plate, a project, something I'm interested in, I'll, I'll dive in real deep, but then I'll move on to the next thing when I'm done and kind of forget half of it. So the, uh, the idea that something that I would have seen as a simple little transducer, when I think back to myself 12 or 15 years ago, there's no way I would think that I would be able to maintain doing something like that for so long, but, uh, I have, and, there is a pretty deep world out there when you get into that stuff and you start getting into the, the old ones and you know, the Gibsons, like I said, that was kind of my, my first heart for this. And, uh, McCarty era Gibson 12 years, years into it never continues to, uh, they're never short on surprises. Even now uh, I'm, uh, I'm finding something new when I, when I open one up after yeah. studying them for so long there's I, no two are alike <laughs> that's that's true you know there, i mean there's trends there's you might have more likely to see <clears throat> this feature or that feature at this time or that time but you know then something comes along that just throws you off i found uh an a3 magnet in a early t-top you know that's sure. kind of unusual and one, one of the real you know the early p90 magnets with one ground flat and it's like you know, the, that, the, that the stuff happens. <laughs> mag magnets got mixed up. They ran out of magnets that day. Uh, let's just shove this in. Mm -hmm. I found uh, a, a work, a, a layer pattern that I'd never seen before. I think it was last year. And they were machine winding. So that is kind of unusual. It was it was original factory soldered cover. Um, mm -hmm. So to find something that had a, a pattern I hadn't seen before was kind of exciting for me. And, you know, that's if you're the kind of dork I am, that's a pretty neat thing to say. <laughs> like, hey, they only had so many machines and those machines were only capable of so much. So, like, you know, why, why is this one like standing out unusually from the others? Man? Oh, and yeah. You see the pictures. You see the pictures of the PAF lines where the it's like all the wires bunched up on one side of the coil or or it's hollowed in the middle. It's like a U or it's or like a mountain in the middle and <laughs> mm -hmm. you see that a lot in like the CBS era fender pickups too. Oh, sure. I think, I think some of that is because the bobbins not being injection molded like PAF bobbins were assembled out of two pieces of four bond and the magnets and, and then lacquer dip. So there's more chances for them to not sit quite right on the machine. And if you have the machine throwing the wire back and forth this distance, and the bobbin sits that same distance in the middle, that's great. But if the bobbin sits off to the side, then it all piles up in one place and you get a pattern that looks kind of like a like a chess piece pawn where there's a, a big right, right. funnel shape on one side and then a lump near the other side and then it falls off. And some of those sound really good. The uh, best Stratocaster I've ever heard had three distinctly different pickup coil shapes like that. And it was a 65. So machine wound, but um, yeah, and I copied them and I, I, I was able to replicate, you know, at least some of that sound from it. It, sure. it had a lot of those characteristics. And so those weird little accidents um, turned out to be uh, some real gems sometimes, not all the time, but certainly sometimes. Interesting. Yeah. The, but I was going to say they're accidents, but they're happy well, accidents, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how many different kinds of magnets were in PAFs? sizes and kinds yeah well I, th I think that's actually kind of hard to to quantify because you can say yeah there's alnico two three four five there's an oriented five there's ones that were about 2.3 inches and ones that were about 2.5 inches right but 
they didn't all come from the same place. They weren't all made at the same time. And so they weren't all made in the same way. So mm -hmm. you, you almost can say countless, yeah. even though there's really only so many <laughs> grades because, okay, well, this, this is, it's an A5, but it's different than all these other A5s because it came from a different time period, a different batch. It was cast differently. Maybe the heating and cooling cycles varied a little bit. Also, it's a little bit shorter and it didn't get charged quite as much as that other one. So you've really got a lot of variables just within like something as small as that. Right. Yeah. And then you brought up charging. Mm -hmm. the, all these magnets, what were they charged to? And yeah. what they are today versus what they were, you know, it's, it's also, you know, different and it will radically change the sound. I will, um, I, I may butt heads with some of my colleagues on, on that one because I've definitely found a lot of magnets that were charged not to full strength. But I did an experiment over seven years where I took original Gibson bar magnets from P90s and PAFs and they ranged in date from 1941 to 1979. And I measured them as received. So when they came to me in the guitar or pickup or whatever it was that I bought that I took them out of. And then I measured them charged to saturation at full strength. And then I separated them from each other <coughs> and stored them in a garage for seven years eventually. But I measured them initially after a day, after three days, after a week, after two weeks, and then after a month, and then, you know, just periodically. And, and what I found was they weren't all full strength necessarily when I got them. Most of them were, were pretty close. Most of them really were. But over the course of those seven years, the, the drop in the strength of the magnet that was significant all happened within the first couple of days. After that, it was almost not measurable. It, it was a really small drop off. Hmm. So it's not, at least in, you know, this limited experiment of, there's only a couple dozen magnets. Um, but at least in that experiment, it's not like, like a water tank with a hole in it. That's just constantly leaking. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it may, may change a little bit, but that first change or that, that early change is really the significant one. And then, mm -hmm. I found them to be pretty, pretty steady. And I've done tests with, with impact. You know, if you drop your guitar, the magnet's going to be come degaussed. Probably not, not in a fall like that. You know, maybe Les Paul's when, when he was in a car accident, you know, that was an impact. Yeah. yeah that that could have degaussed the magnets. Um, leaning them up against the back of a speaker cabinet. Uh, I don't measure a whole lot of magnetic strength. Even if you take something like, say, say like a JBL D120 or mm -hmm. a G12H, a Celestion, a, you know, ceramic magnet with the big magnet. Outside the cabinet, on the side of the cabinet or the back of the cabinet, right behind the magnet, magnetic charge diminishes very quickly with airspace. And that little amount of airspace of a few inches or whatever is enough that you're really not measuring a whole lot more right outside the cabinet with the meter right up against the back of the cabinet than you are in just the ambient atmosphere of the world and our magnetic stuff that happens around us, poles of the earth. And, you know, it, it's, it's pretty weak there. Now, setting a guitar on top of, you know, something like that 72 super lead over there where you've got the transformers cooking, like, yeah, maybe, I don't know. I haven't measured that, but, I know if you put <clears throat> like if I if I if I put the power station within close proximity in the right distance and orientation to one of those amps that's uh, full throttle there can be some interaction between the two you might have to say sure. so I know I know the fields are significant and they're they're throwing around a lot of power there it, it would be neat to measure that but I haven't interesting you can stick in one lane here with pickups. It's fine. <laughs> That's funny. Um, we have a question. James, what's the earliest Gibson humbucker you've taken apart? Humbucker? Well, 1957. There might have been something in 56, but I haven't gotten to it. Gibson pickup, um, 1941. Uh, fairly long uh, 
pick up it, it looked like it actually was hand wound um orientation very similar to uh, a p90 or the pickups you might see in the, the lap steels or the jazz boxes before that where there were steel slugs down the center rather than screws mm. but still magnets pointing towards each other underneath them the field kind of wrapping around and it was uh made out of um not not phenolic the uh the tortoise shell material like uh you would see on a, a precision base pick card um celluloid and so that had all shrunk and it was one piece on the top and then another piece wrapped around kind of like binding and so that had shrunk and cracked and separated and the top sort of shrunk and flipped up around the edges uh it was salvageable but cool. i've seen i've seen others that were not and they needed to have a new piece cut out of you know like replica tortoise shell or whatever which doesn't quite look the same but it's right. still saveable all right here's one favorite paf that you ever had your hands on oh man like what's and what were the specs song? of it? you know just <laughs> for for what like uh, i'm gonna it depends dave <laughs> <Depends. laughs> uh, hey someone uh, used it on me look at that <laughs> it depends for what application so i've got a set of 59s and one of my favorite les pauls over here that are what you would expect they've got stronger magnets um they've got hotter coils they're fairly balanced coils the wire was a little bit thinner and uh they're a big woody chewy kind of sound now that's a great sound if you're going for that i'm not going to say warren haynes but it, it is like in that direction um mm -hmm. but at the but, same time i also like some of the later ones where it's a little bit lower output a5 magnets low round coils uh, wire was a little bit different too and, and different steels and those have they've taken a step in the direction of a t-top and it's kind of a linear progression towards that end of yeah, the got weaker yeah the t -top. you just get a uh like a nice jangly crisp top end but not harsh and brittle like a lot of modern stuff but uh, a nice open breathy clear crisp top end a good pick attack whether it be on the upper strings or if you're doing some some chunky palm beauty stuff a nice little yeah. compressed tightness there i i yeah. like those too describes a t-top very well Mm -hmm. And I think that the the end of the era PAFs and then the transitional pickups that you might call PAF bobbin patent number decal humbuckers, we should really have a shorter name for those. And we just call them like, I don't know, whatever. But they, they, um, there's some similarities there. I think a lot of times, honestly, like those last PAFs, the patent number decals, there's still variants there and there's still variants in the T-tops, but it's becoming less variance by that point and they really sound more like t-tops than they do those earlier ones especially like the the first pafs that are that are uh you know, often a3 magnets and a, a very kind of like a like a mike bloomfield super sessions or a uh, mm. uh like a like a fogarty's original gold top kind of clarity to it they they have they they actually sound a lot like the p90s of that time where they have something that's like a a jangle but not in a t-top way more of like what you'd get as a jangle in a like a steel string martin dreadnought that that kind big, of topic. big telly big telly yeah big telly big black guard telly early mm -hmm. telly with the a3s not the not not like don rich but like roy well roy buchanan is a yeah. like, little bit like danny the big Gatt fat or, telly which is actually very similar to like a p90 or something if you want to hmm well in this when you think especially if you take that telling. pickup out of the bridge i think the the actual steel bridge on a telecaster has a lot to do with that sound too sure you, you can take that pickup out and mount it in like a ring and a les paul and it it sounds like its own thing but it doesn't sound like a telly anymore no the the, the brass the brass saddles on the steel um yeah that too stamped bridge mm -hmm. yeah that, that makes, all that makes, adds makes up bit, that's a sound i think so for sure yeah. and fender so still makes those apparently per their factory tours those those dies that stamp those bridges are in uh corona and they've got them up there on a shelf and you see the the race in olmstead dies that they were using back now <laughs> still stamping some of that stuff i think the pick guards too although they're vinyl now but yeah 
it's it's cool to see that stuff still in action. <laughs> Absolutely. What's the uh, what's the hottest PAF that, was ah, that, that you've ever that you've about? seen? Here we are. DC Vintage. resistance was bound to come up. Oh yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> of course. So hottest the hottest um, the hottest that I've seen. Are we talking millivolt output, which matters, or are we talking DCR, which doesn't matter? <laughs> in a very okay, simple, since most very people simple way, you could say you might have not uncommon an 8.5 K ish reading 1957 PAF with an a three magnet, which is very weak. And then you have a, a T top that reads 7.1, 7.2 with an a five magnet that is much stronger. The output is going to be a lot stronger in that T top. Yeah. The, the, the physical output of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now hotter coils, just how many turns you see on the coils. If you want to break it down to that way, you see them more in the, late 59 kind of early 60 at least i have i got a, some spreadsheets where i chart this stuff and you, and you do sort of see trends but then there's oddball stuff too you know you see random things i saw a patent number decal pick up the red over 9k i, I have seen pfs the red over nine. not it's not common i've mm -hmm. seen them that read under seven it, and a lot of it's just um not necessarily the turns but just the wire itself the the official standard for a gauge of fine gauge magnet wire today, when you buy it, is four times tighter tolerance than it was in the 50s. And that's for the copper core thickness and the insulation thickness. So when you buy wire now, you buy it in half gauges, and then they split those half gauges into what they call minimum nominal or nominal maximum. So it's really a quarter gauge they run the wire through the machine through their dies and, and they measure it and then they say like okay this falls into this tolerance this falls into that same as resistors and capacitors as i understand you know that's why we get these weird like 3.3k 2.7k because they're those numbers as i understand it you i'm sure you know more than i do on that dave were numbers where they can just make a batch of resistors and there's no duds because everyone falls into one of those ranges more easily is that about right yeah Okay. So similar with the wire. You're buying wire that's four times a tighter tolerance now. So now it's easier to make pickups that are more consistent. Um, but back then, same 42 gauge wire, same machine running the same coil pattern, same turn counts, but you have a spool today and a spool tomorrow and a spool next month, and you might have quite different DCR. But coils probably sound fairly similar to each other despite that dcr change in that case okay there's a question here from mark g why did people become fixated on dcr oh i, I have a theory i i don't know but it seems likely that two things two things one it's probably the only tool an ohm meter a, D, a, meter, a multimeter that most guitarists have in their garage and their truck and their car that they can measure anything at all about a pickup with. Mm. Yeah. Most people can't measure inductance or capacitance or magnetic gauss, and they can't have a test rig where you measure like a millivolt output, which, which is actually difficult to do too. And that's why there's no standard across the yeah. industry. Like there is with microphones and speakers, because it's like, you know, well, how, how many millivolts does this put out? Right. Exactly. You can't, how, you can't you know, do the only way you can eject the signal is to, really strum the guitar and if you're yep. strumming your guitar the signal levels all over the place mm -hmm. you, you know. forget that a lot of the studies that you see that are done testing pickups are done with an induction coil and that's great if you don't care about testing the magnet you only care about testing the coils but that's the thing is if you test a pickup with an induction coil and you take the magnet out of that pickup while you're testing it the pickup still works <laughs> you take the yeah, magnet like, like, out of a pickup in a guitar it no longer works <laughs> there's a there's a system of interaction there with, that involves the magnet and the strings and the steel parts of the pickup so when you start doing these tests with induction coils you're not measuring everything you're measuring a piece of it it's not to say that there's no value in that but it's it's not a complete test and that's why there is not a standard 
like when you buy a microphone, you look at the back of the polar pattern in the charts, or you buy a speaker and you look at the frequency response graphs. That's why there isn't that for pickup manufacturers. It's not that we're lazy or haven't come to terms on it. It's that it depends. Like, like so much. Yeah, I, you know, the, the funny thing is, yeah, it, exactly. Steve Blucher said to me a long time ago, he goes, yeah, DCR makes no difference whatsoever. Don't even look at it. It's, it's, that's why DiMarzio doesn't list their DCR really. The, the, um, and, you know, and it, it, you know, it'll depend on what magnet. So you can take the same coils and El Nico 2, El Nico 3, El Nico 4, El Nico 5, El Nico 8 with the same coils, but they'll have different outputs. They will. So output levels, signal level, and how that, hard it hits your amp to explain that simply. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. And that, that leads into my, my second of the two part. The first part of why DCR, I think, is prominent is because it's the only thing most people can measure. The other part is because the first aftermarket pickups were probably the, uh, the popular, at least, the super distortions. And so you had these pickups that all of a sudden, like, oh, these read like 13, 14K, and they have high <laughs> output. And I, and I think that that association was just made and and intentionally marketed as well by by some um you know this is like the hot pickup more more power for your live sound and you know stage volume and so, and so that dcr to output association was made but the truth is a super distortion doesn't really have any more wire on it than a, a paf or a t-top it's that it's a smaller gauge of wire the ceramic it, magnet it's a ceramic magnet. That is the output. If you take a low reading 7K T-top and a 14K super distortion and you swap the magnets between the two, the T-top is the high output pickup and the super distortion is the low output pickup. It's all the magnet there. The turn counts are actually extremely close to where it almost doesn't matter. The DCR is just a matter of the wire gauge used on one from the other. Hmm. But that's not to say that you can't play with the DCR and also get more output. <laughs> yeah, the, the two can operate together <laughs> or independently. You put an Alnico 2 magnet in a pickup, it's going to seem weaker mm -hmm. and sweeter, but you can up the DC on it a little bit and kind of it's a teeter-totter, sort of, you know? You can raise the turn counts and that will inadvertently raise the dcr mm -hmm. yeah so that they they can operate together like that and you could probably touch on it more than i could on this dave is that also the loading of the amp at least if you're going direct in and not through a buffer your dcr is going to have an impact on the front end of that amp sure how how what load is on the pickup mm-hmm just what 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 load is presented to the right the input of the amplifier what pot in your guitar <laughs> what value pot in your guitar even if it's a 500k pot let's say is it a 500k pot oh yeah that could be a 350k <laughs> pot that could be a 400k pot that could if be, it's a central lab it could be a meg and a half <laughs> you know it could be a million different things and then you're paralleling that into a one meg input impedance on an amp. But if you stick a an old uh, vintage wah in between that wasn't a true bypass, then that's a whole different load. Again, it's dropping the load and then it's changing the output of your pickup. And it's a teeter totter. It's a big ass teeter totter in all sorts of directions. It's it's a giant bowl of it depends. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, when, when when this when the, you know when the uh, Eddie Van Halen thing came up too, I have I have another little theory. Oh, I'm uh, happy to talk about that stuff. I love it. I love hearing yeah. you talk about it. <laughs> you know, no one really talks about this, but okay. So, say the original pickup was you know out of his three thirty five, like he said, and it probably was. Um. Who knows what that it was exactly? Who knows what magnet was in it exactly? Probably have an idea roughly. But so he 
hobbles these guitars together. Do you think he really thought about what pot he was putting in it? No, the one within reach, I would guess, just based on yeah. his experiments. So was that out of a Strat or was it out of a Les Paul? Yeah, who knows? Because the, w wasn't the original, well, not the original, but there were, there were parts of both in that guitar. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, you know, it stemmed from a Fender originally. And, and, and if you have a 335 that's not working, you've got four 500K pots there. But if you're putting together a, yeah, yeah. Who, who, who really or, were they, or were they 300K pots? So, yeah. so what pot did he grab off the table to put in the guitar? Right. And, and he changing the pot on a stringy PAF sounding pickup changes a lot. And it's not just high frequency. It changes to, for me. No, it's it, not. It changes yeah. something in the high mids too. Like, yep. and it's more uh, to like a cover when you get into those lower pots, you get a, Kind of like a, a a higher hump at the resonant peak, it, right? Exactly, a higher hump at the resonant peak, and and it comes across as a in a similar way, I think, to a cover. And you almost get like this kind of like cool, like metallic plink. There's some sweetness there. It's not it's not just a mid boost like you get on an EQ. It's some. Mm -hmm. It know, didn't. I, I tried the experiment of putting a two two fifty k pot in my seventy eight guitar, and and I have a PAF style type pickup in there. It, I didn't like how it sounded. I think it would be it probably sounded, dark. It sounded, but... Yeah, it did, it didn't sound good. I I liked it better with the uh, the 500k pot personally. It sounded. But how hot is that pickup? Oh, um... that's wound hotter, isn't it? Isn't that what's in that guitar? Fralin? No, actually. Uh... Oh, that's the one that I did. That was the Duncan Custom, which is a hotter pickup, actually. With a with a hotter pickup, I would tend to think that it would not sound good at all. Mm -hmm. It sounded horrible. But yeah. with a weaker stringy pickup, mm. or ceramic, or slightly offset, a ceramic in a lower value pot you know, can be a cool combination. One of these days, Michael Nielsen's going to do this video after if I ever wire his pick guard for him. You know, That's, like with with this topic, it's fun to dive deep. But one thing that I, I try to keep in mind that I brought up a number of times is that we we know on that first album, there were more than one guitar. They had different pickups. Sure. But the, the but the differences don't sound. It doesn't sound like, it's, oh, yeah, obviously, this is so much different. It still sounds like Ed. Sure. Yeah. There's a consistency through it. Now, the first album <laughs> to the second album, is, you know, there's a bigger difference there. But is that, you know, is that Ted Templeman? Is, is that Ed? Like, I don't know. You probably know more than I do. Second album is my favorite anyway. I I like a lot of it. I like both. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think if I, yeah, I don't want to have to choose. I'm glad we don't have to choose. We don't have to choose. Yeah. I'm not gonna right, we don't it. have to choose. Uh, <laughs> you know, the most important part is none of us had his fingers. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. You know, it's just it. The, the second album is drier. There's not as much reverb. It doesn't. It doesn't have as much ambience. I think it's so, way more natural sounding. And, yeah. And to me, the whole band sounds better as a whole. Meaning the drums sound better. The the bass yeah. sounds better. Oh, that's for and sure. And the guitar to me sounds like the amp's gonna just explode. That's what I like about it. I like that sound. There there is a nice cut and a crispness to the sound on the first one too, though. And he hated that. Yeah, I've heard you say that. He wasn't yeah. really a fan. But he also he hated the first record. Did was he ever happy with his sound? Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah probably not. <laughs> Just the way he like chased sound. <clears throat> yeah. 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 True. So he was uh, happy with it after you worked on his amp, right? Uh he was happier than he'd been in 20 years with it. Well, that's so I will I'll, I'll take that. Uh, yeah, really. I mean, that's quite an impressive that. statement. That's I'll right. take that. So what amps do you have behind you? Okay. Um, here, Marshall. Let me pull out a little bit. <laughs> so this is going to be pre-Zounds Marshalls. So they're going to be pre-Zounds. Oh, pre <laughs> yeah, they're, they're all pre-Zounds. <laughs> They've so gone up substantially now. That you know, they're, On the top is a, a 60 basement, but the cab's not original, but the, the speakers and the, the iron and all the guts are. Hmm. This is a... 60 oh hold on one second here i just had a 
I just got a refueling. Um, <laughs> nice. uh, 67 twin reverb uh blackface 66 super reverb nice. this was this was my first fender and this was the shop amp at one of the shops i mentioned that i, I worked at for a little while and it, it was just like a known amp it was such a great sounding amp and i was so pleased when um the guy who worked there who owned it retired and called me to say like okay i actually will sell this to you because it was one of those things was like hey if you ever sell it if you ever sell it if you ever sell it <laughs> and that stuff doesn't usually work out and one day he no. called me he was like you still want it want yeah i do and so i got that and i got he i also got at the same time from him um an echoplex ep3 Ooh. with a handwritten letter from mike battle who had serviced it the inventor of wow it, saying jay you've got such a wonderful example here are you i'm so happy to, to have something that sounds this nice come back and know that they're out there like please keep it forever <laughs> so that was a cool treat um but to continue with the tour there's a 69 twin reverb with jbl d120s there that Ouch. that's the amp i use most in working with pickups because it's extremely revealing you think <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's extremely clean and clear, but it still it still sounds like a guitar amp and not a not a PA amp. Um, and, and it just the, you you can't hide anything behind that. The feel that you can understand from playing a pickup through that amp or guitar or whatever you put into it um, comes through better than I think anything else in the room. Uh, below is a '68 um, Super Reverb Drip Edge. <laughs> And that one I got because the, the, the 66 has the CTS speakers in it. And I wanted to try the Almicos. And I so I got that one. And then I realized that the amps themselves, independently of the speakers, also sound significantly different enough that I, I just decided to keep them as they were. I thought they were. Um, that one is a 71 Super Lead. Uh, it's actually a, it's a leader. It's a bass it's a factory conversion so the back panel is printed base the inspection tags printed base but it has like the little gold foil sticker lead over it and uh it yeah the the um uh, turrets on the board were originally positioned for base so it's a factory conversion i guess you'd say mm -hmm. but, but, and it's got the date stamps that tag is actually pretty clear so it has the, the date stamps to show it went back in like 73 and 74 so i guess whoever got it was taking it in for maintenance and whatnot mm. uh with those cabs are pulsonic cone g12h 55s um the and that's my like big chewy kind of marshally sound although maybe you know, i might like to talk to you about that one sometimes that it's got a little something to it that i'm not thrilled about but uh 67 super lead and this is awesome for like new wave of british heavy metal 70s rock it, it has a nice crispness to it i really like it in a lot of ways um uh, and that's both of those cabs are g12 m's uh the lower one is pulsonics and then the upper one are 74 cream backs. and that that was chris Marin's cab um which he put the cream backs in it weird enough and i i liked it i bought it for the speakers and then decided i just kind of like it so i i I had to replace two of the speakers, hmm. but I replaced them with originals, matching codes. And behind the mic. Oh, am I too far? Can you guys hear me okay? I was oh, over yeah. here. I heard you. Okay. Um, this is kind of mics in the way, but there's a, uh, there we go. That is a uh, Landry LS50. And I think that one's number two. So cool. Was, that was a very early one. I know you guys had Bill on. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that amp is unlike any other amp I've I've ever played, um, inside and out. It's an amp that I bought when I was in my last band. So I bought that amp as a performer to do a lot of things at once. We covered a lot of ground. It wasn't a cover band, but we had a kind of a range of styles and sounds we did. And there was some heavier stuff, but it was a female vocalist. So I wanted a lot of, you know what that amp edged out by like an inch and i i regret it at the time and i only got it because i was in a band but the other thing that i had considered when i bought that at the new york amp show was a marsha oh wow. yeah a long time ago yeah <laughs> yep and um in in many ways 
the Marshall would have been better for me, but in that one band, I needed to do more stuff. And that's yeah. When it came through. Uh, but I've kept it and I've messed around with it a little bit. Um, with Bill's help, he sent me some different caps and was like, try this here, try that there and change this. And I put a, um, a bypass for the negative feedback and I put a second bright cap on one of the gain stages. So you can kind of dial in like which, which gain knob you have up or down. If you're using more or less bright cap, but still have the same amount of gain, which I think is actually a pretty fun feature there. Mm. Um, but I don't, it's really not an amp I use a lot now because I'm I'm not playing out. I use this other stuff mostly as references because I I, I want to have standard sounds as I'm working with pickups. If somebody sends me a guitar to do voicing or if I'm building something, I want to have like, you know, like okay, this is that thing and it works this way with it. Mm -hmm. So it's more in the interaction there. And then I've got a early, pig nose. Early pig nose, yeah. <laughs> Very nice. The, the cons turbo tuner sitting on top of a. A 57 champ and a wide panel deluxe there and then there's a there's an ultra linear twin so there are a couple linear. other marshals above the fenders in the back of you okay oh yeah yeah so um the lower one there is uh it's a 59 hw okay so that one i bought uh when guitar shows were still a thing and so that was the one to go out and just be like the standard sound that people could be familiar with of the plexi, but also something that they might have heard at a guitar center or whatever, just to be familiar with it and something that I wasn't worried about. I mean, you know, those things don't get locked up at night. They just sit out in the booth. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't really interested in bringing out the, the originals that I love so much. And then above that is a chassis that is an amp uh, I'm building. I'm building three of them now. Uh, that one, I got a, I got a set of original, uh, iron. So a lay down transformer and out, an output transformer oh, cool. and, and a choke from, from 68. Right. And I've been monkeying around with, you know, those guys over time and sort of trying to find what I like and, you know, chasing the, uh, the plexi sound, chasing, right. chasing, uh, one, two, three, oh, one sound. Right. I know <laughs> a little bit about that one. I know you do. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I, I decided to kind of start building them. So I, I, the original iron came to me after I had started. I was going to build two different versions of a uh, a twelve series, um, one kind of like an earlier, pretty much stock parts, and then one sort of going more for specifically a, an Ed thing. And then I got the vintage iron, so it turned into three builds. Um, <laughs> one one cool thing that. I, that came as a result of those builds was that uh, Rewind teamed up with, um, are you familiar with Brian Sowers, Sour Sound? Yeah, sort of, I think. He is like known for tape echoes, like space echoes and echo plexes and stuff. And, they, and he built some amps and now he's just doing transformers. So he does rewinds and, and rapple goes. And I, I think he's probably got a, a more of a reputation in the tweed world, mm -hmm. but he, um, he was willing to build something for me. And so um, right now we're in the process of getting this out there and uh, he's doing a, a lay down hundred watt power transformer for me that has an extra tap. And I know that we've seen like extra B plus taps before. I mm -hmm. wanted to do it a different way. I wanted a, a separate primary tap. Oh yeah. That's how, yeah. That's how sir does it. That's how, is that right? That's how so, so I'm they, doing it on a new amp. That's how. Um, is that right? That's how we used to do it um, with on the Metro Friedman that I made with George Metropolis. Okay, so you put your you were doing it as as basically a variac thing, but yeah. On the so primary? basically, you get instead of 120 volt, you get 150 volt tap. Yeah, it's just to emulate a. a 90 well, it's volt actually input. you can add one at the bottom of the ladder, so it it can work for any any voltage that you have set okay I, I i didn't know that was a thing but yeah i kind of fell into that by um yeah because the, the important thing about that is is having the the heaters drop yep that's exactly where heaters, i that. <laughs> the heaters is actually where the sound is yeah i i had seen i think like probably Habo or not and others had like a separate b plus tap 
but I had been monkeying around. Yeah, but around. Haber, Haber's done them before. <laughs> and, is that right? Way. And yeah. when I when I um when I lowered just the B plus, but kept the heaters at a steady voltage, I didn't really like it as much as when yeah. I just used a real variac and right. dropped the whole thing. Correct. So I was like, why, why don't we just do that? Just put a tap there. So yeah, that, yeah, no, that works great. That's in that's in the works. But he Brian's doing a really cool job. He's gone through and like examined the lamination materials. Now he sent me photos of these like originals, like taken to pieces on his bench and had me measure voltages at nodes here and there under various loads. And it, like, well, yeah, but you know the 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 volt the for that twelve series amp that twelve oh three one amp. You want to see that that B plus. Well, say 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 the tubes are biased normally, and say you're at a normal one twenty watt wall voltage, with mm-hmm. the heaters at six point three volts. Uh, meaning you set the variac so it's exactly six point three volts on your heaters, which is theoretically one twenty. Uh, well, maybe not an original transformer, but I did this with those those early transformers were basically. You wanted to, they were 460 to 470 volts DC with kind of a normal bias, like a 35 milliamp bias or something. I'm, I'm going to try and pull up my chart real quick and see if I can, I can read you my. Uh, Got a little openness. higher later. That 72 over there has just like ridiculously high voltage on it and it and at 120 volts the heaters read 6.3 so it's not that i'm feeding it too hot mm-hmm. but the plates on that are nuts and i measured that and it, it was putting out nearly 140 watts yeah it's probably like anywhere but that's not what i'm going for for this build i actually no, it's probably <laughs> anywhere from 480 to 500 volts yeah, it, it it is in that range. I have a chart for that somewhere too, if if we want to get into yeah. that. Most all the early seventies amps were around four eighty. Mm-hmm. A little bit later, seventy four, seventy five, it, it got to be around five hundred. And it it would just cook tubes. The only things that I could put in that are um, Blackburn Mullards or um, the Ruby BHTs. It it would <laughs> handle, but I wasn't really thrilled with the way they sounded. Yeah. So. It's and I I had something else in it. Um, might have been like I had SEDs in it, but they really just aren't like I like, don't like them in Marshalls for that. Mm-hmm. Like they, yeah, they they might. I don't cool. like them at all. Really, <laughs> never did. Yeah, I um, yeah, it's it's got Mollard Blackburn Factory XF2s in it now, and and I like that. And if it chews through them, whatever, life's short, you know. So be it. I was going to say, well, good luck finding another another quad of those. You can well, find them. There's another just quad another one. Oh, can you? <laughs> it's expensive. Yeah, quite very expensive. Um, so Harmonicaster has a question. Uh, yeah. From Super Chat. Why have there been so few pickup designs since 1950s? EMG Actives, Lace Sensors, and Almut... Almut- Alumatones. Alum- Alumatones. Yeah. Larry Fishman Fluences seem to be about it. Well, EMGs had a really good run, and they still do. But a lot of those others are kind of niche. There's not a huge market for it. You know, I could make some new design pickups that I think are cool, and I think take aspects of things I've learned from vintage pickups and maybe mix them together and apply them to new ones, and almost nobody will buy them. It probably wouldn't pay for the tooling to do it. (laughs) Probably, but what if about, I made a, what about a better gold? PAF replica, then that's that's what everybody wants, and and not for no reason. They sound there's some really great classic recordings, and those pickups are very responsive. And even even Gibson and Fender today can't recreate their old stuff. It's just like there is some really awesome qualities to a lot of these old pickups. Right. What about uh gold foil pickups? They're a thing. They're not my thing, but they're a thing. Um, they're a little, a little thinner and weaker sounding. Um, they're, they're the original, like the Tyscos were not made to be repaired at all. They're riveted together. The bobbins are made out of paper soaked in glue. So when you repair them, it's, it's very difficult. You're pretty much drilling it out and recreating the pickup minus the magnet in the cover. You're rebuilding the entire inside from the ground up. Mm. I don't do a lot of that. I've done some of that. I could say, uh, Brandon Wound, I think, has a pretty good 
uh, reputation for doing well with those. Uh, if, if somebody has one that they need work on, that that would probably be a quicker and more economical way to get it done than going through me. I, not that I couldn't do it. Gotcha. Yeah, but it is interesting that there haven't been. But you're right. I mean, for the most part, there there could be a thousand different new pickup designs, but will they sell? There's a base company called Zon that made some really awesome high-end bases, and they had a pickup system called a Light Wave. And the early ones were IR LEDs. I think they did move to lasers at one point, but in the saddles, they had a, a light shine across the string and a receiver on the other side of the string pick it up. And that was how they captured the sound. Huh. And what that kind of caught on to, it wasn't their initial designer intent, but they found that that was a much more accurate way to trigger a MIDI signal than the Roland Hex pickups because that light could actually calculate the note in one half cycle of a wave rather than where the Roland had to get a few cycles to count them and time them to then trigger it. So there was less latency with the Zon stuff. So, th I mean, there are, there have been some, that's a really awesome innovation in pickups uh, that was probably around 2009, 2008, something like that. Uh, most people no never cares. heard of it. Yeah, nobody cares. Yeah. <laughs> most people never heard of it. Interesting. Um, so quick. Yeah. Uh, Enrico has a question. And I was curious when we were going to bring it up. So we might as well bring it up now uh dave what are your thoughts on the marshall family selling more shares as a fan and as a different manufacturer so they i think they sold i mean the company is now owned by zounds right yeah. but they're still they're still on the board i think they're still i think 24 or 5 percent share or something that's what i um, read it was a quarter share yeah. um quarter percentage i i don't feel one way or another really i i um Marshall stopped being Marshall years ago, I think. I mean, I mean, think about it. I mean, really, what's the last thing that really resonated and did really well for them, you know? The JVM. I guess the JVM. Yeah. I mean, sure. Um, that fridge is pretty cool. <laughs> okay yeah the fridge is pretty good i mean you know to be honest i mean so you know the bluetooth players were cool too i mean they they they, they uh they look cool and you know they worked uh i i don't think they've really there hasn't really been guitar players running it for a long time you know what i mean so um i know there was lots of stuff on the table i know when santiago was there mm. But uh, I, it never come to fruition. I guess I you know. I Is he know. back there? He was back, right? Yeah, I don't think he's there anymore, though. Again? Yeah. yeah. So, Shit. so I, I, you know, I don't know. It's, it's. Uh, I, I think it's a hard. Uh, you know, you'd almost have to make the company smaller again. How do you do that? You know what? You, you know, you, you, you'd almost have to start over. Kitchen Marshall too. You know, I, I think they were kind of late to the game when you thoroughly think about it. You know, I think there were a lot of boutique companies that came about and, you know, came up with mo more modern features and stuff. And, you know, I mean, the JVM was really the first, you know, real multi-channel, more modern featured amp. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was an all tube signal pass so that was cool that was better than the stuff they've been doing previous you know but that was that was, that was santiago the other amp that i the only other amp that i've wanted and i've looked on the used market maybe one day i'll pick one up is uh a vintage the vintage modern hmm. the vintage modern is it had some interesting concepts uh a lot can be done with it mm. oh interesting yeah a guy who did some demo work for me, had one of those. And when he changed from using that to using just a 59 hand wired, and then the other amp he was using was a, uh, oh, it's not a Dr. Dan, it's a, a rocket retro. Mm -hmm. And it just like his, it was such a massive improvement. I, I couldn't see myself wanting a vintage modern when you could maybe just put a 
pedal up front or, or, or like you said, tweak it. You could probably mm-hmm. do something with it. I, there's something funny about it. It just seemed. Oh yeah. Flat. Yeah. I don't know. And, and Hey, this, that's just one experience with it. So, you know, it could have been something else in his rig too. I got a bad impression of it though. Mm. It's probably just gas, my, my gas for it. You know, <laughs> so, one of those. so um, I don't think with knowing what you own, I don't think you'd be that happy. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Cool. Yeah. I mean, as far as my, my opinion, uh, it looks like Marshall's going to be going down the path of more lifestyle type of products. Sure. You know, um, I don't know. Marshall sneakers, um, worked out for Gibson with Henry Jeskowitz. Yeah. That was great. Everybody loved the firebird X. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, robo yeah. tuners are such a hit yeah that was, that was a huge hit that was a huge hit yeah i don't know i mean i wish him well and uh I, I mean absolutely i mean yeah do it but you know i don't think it would be interesting if someone came in and did something with it yeah so do you think number one is uh up for sale maybe there's another chance when you guys want to spot me a quick couple million couple yeah. <laughs> i think it's more than a couple probably huh yeah it's probably yeah yeah that's uh maybe keith richards would be interested <laughs> <laughs> um interestingly and is is seymour duncan a private company they're not they've never been bought out have they no i think they're they're still privately owned company yeah interesting that is interesting. Um, James, which pickup is your best seller, most popular over the last couple of years? Creme Brulee's, which is a an A2, um, 1959 style PAF, are continue to be very popular and have been. Um, they were one of the early ones I did. The Yeah, if you click on that, it'll scroll down through them find them there but uh the the paf ones are another set which are those are actually the the pickups i described earlier that are in this r9 over here is the kind of warmer chewier really woody sounding hotter coils um that's that's what the paf ones uh were made from and in fact the two pickups in that guitar come from two different es 345s and the two pickups that were destroyed to make the paf ones are each of their partners so i took and they sound fairly similar the fact that they came out of two guitars is just kind of weird um or or irrelevant at least but i took my favorite two of the four and made that set and then kept the other two because i thought they sounded fairly similar and so those were my reference of like am i copying these well so i could have my work plus the original basically side by side at the same time those have been those have also been very popular so l- let me ask you a question so I'm, I'm glancing at the website right now so i can't actually see your face <laughs> okay. um okay let's let's just go down your your lineup here you have a 57 paf mm-hmm. uh tell a short bit about that sure um and h150 um pedal steel is what that came out of it was a Mm pre-decal um and that 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 one pickup you can see featured pretty heavily in my book if anybody has that you'll find photos in there uh, of me taking that apart all the way down to the coils showing the wire and such and uh that that is very similar to that uh mike bloomfield or john fogarty kind of sound i mentioned earlier where there's a lot of a lot of that early 50s p90 a3 sound in that one it, it has that that martin steel string dreadnought jangle to it and not like a new one but like a 70s 60s martin maybe where it's a little bit it's big and full and super clear and you get a lot of great detail on the lower frets of the wound strings but it, it has a nice jangly top end not not sparkly in a t-top way but nice and nice and sweet jangle i guess that's got only three. only go three correct yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's a three and i think a lot of and zero offset my, or near zero offset mm-hmm. and in, in my experience that's fairly typical of those early pafs was that they were using the um the magnets 
or those P90s. I, I think a lot of the reason we see the magnets start switching up in that PAF era a lot um, is because of a physical fitment issue. This is just my theory. I try to be kind of clear on what's, you know, something I've discovered and something I'm just like theorizing on. But the P90 magnets that you see a lot in the 50s had, you know, it's a, it's got six sides. It's, it's a rectangular cube. They had one side ground flat, which is the, um, the south side on each magnet. And that's the side that touches the keeper bar of each magnet. And then the screws pass through that in the middle. And then the north side of those magnets on the outside just face outward and don't touch anything. And they're left rough. So they were just machining one surface flat. And that's what you see in most of the early PAFs. And then shortly after the PAFs came about, 58-ish, you start seeing more different types of magnets. And also that both sides are now machined flat because now in the new humbucker design that Gibson had come up with, that north side of the magnet now has to sit flat up against the slugs in the second coil that wasn't there to begin with. So gotcha. my theory is that it was just a physical fitment issue. They, they were like, ah, these P90 magnets, and are, down. they're not fitting too well in these humbuckers that we're making <laughs> now. We have to get some new magnets that are ground flat. And as a non-primary uh, issue, they got different types of magnets as well. And I see those other magnets almost as if they're reserved for the p90 still so you still see those flat on one side magnets go all the way through 59 in p90s and sometimes later but primarily and then it seems to be about 1959 that the p90s also start getting the newer magnets and at that point a lot of them are a5s and so you get a lot of these p90s in 59 that have the magnets ground flat on both sides even though they didn't have to be and they also happen to be you know the stronger magnets of you know a5s and such mm. um just my theory but as i chart this stuff out and, and i get them in for repairs or whatnot like it it seems to flow that direction then you have a 1958 paf that's a lineup. very kind of hollow sound uh it is also an a2 paf but uh not as creamy and chewy and vocal in the mid-range as the creme brulees the, they're a little bit uh, more scooped in the mids and a little bit more hollow sounding. Mm -hmm. And then the creme brulee. And those are the thick, chewy, meaty, very vocal, uh, mid-range A259 style PAF. So uh, those would be the warmest of my lineup, um, although not at all dark or muddy. W one thing that I keep in everything that I'm happy to put my name on is it's got to have that open breathy top end no matter how hot or thick the mids get i don't want it going out the door without that that's the thing that drew me into pafs to begin with and mm -hmm. so it, it has to have that it, like it, it's just gotta have an open airy breathy top to it no matter how chewy and thick it gets okay then you got your 1959 the paf ones yes yeah and those are I, I do them in an a4 and an a5 version so the a4 version is going to have more mids and the a and, and it's going to also be uh tighter dynamics broader dynamic range a little bit more touch sensitive the a5 version is a little bit more scooped in the mids uh crisper treble tighter bass um nice for maybe heavier sounds palm muting crisp leads and uh, where that a4 version is the kind of woodier sounding pickup we were talking about earlier okay so you covered the a5 in that one the, the, the of the 59 so then you go to the 1960 a2 pf mm -hmm. okay so a little bit lower output coils uh the coils are getting a little bit more consistent by this time and that is a sound that i think uh it's sort of like a, a landmark PAF sound when things have started to tame down from the earlier PAFs. Things are getting a little bit more consistent. You're still seeing a mix of magnets, so I offer that one in an A2 and an A5. Uh, but there's a real nice metallic plink, kind of a very chirpy top end to mm. that, that that you get. And it's it's that, like, just as the PAFs just start to take a direct step in the direction of the T-tops that would come later. Still a PAF, but just taking a step there. And it has a nice sweet chirp to the top, uh, particularly in the A2 version. It has that, that kind of sweet softness to the upper notes on the, on the unwound strings. 
Uh, and then similarly to the A5 version of the PAF1, the A5 version of the 1960 is going to have less mids than the A2. It's going to have a little bit more output because it's a stronger magnet, crisper top end, tighter low end. And that one is actually, you could say it's a couple more steps in that direction of a T-top. Okay. Oh, it keeps going. <laughs> you're, you're, we're, yeah, there's, there's a few more. <laughs> 64 bad all, number yeah. decal humbuckers. Yeah, we need like a shorter range for this. Can we just call them like uh, cream pickups or like Eric Johnson's SG pickups? But yeah, that, that's what that is. The uh, that is the sound that you would get in, in a pickup, like say like Eric Clapton's Cherry Red sixty four three thirty five or his SG of the same year, same pickups, yeah. and they are that kind of hybrid between a late PAF and a T top. They, they share qualities of both. Kind of thicky, th thicker and chewy, but still with that crisp top end to it, although not as jangly and bright as a T top. And then, of course, we have the T top, which is two kinds of T tops there um, an earlier and a later. So, your, your, oh boy. your, your earlier 68, I think is, is what I've called it, is a. Uh, oh, that's a 72. The 72, okay, 72 would be uh, more like a, like Jimmy Page's bridge after the change to the T top. So, you get. Mm -hmm. Real, real kind of spanky, bright, jangly thing going on there. The other T top set is a little bit warmer and thicker. And there's not a lot of variety out there in T tops. I really just have those two because I think that kind of covers the ground between you get the really lower output, brighter, spanky ones, and then the ones that had just a little bit more meat to them. Hmm. JP pre seventy two. Yep, there we go touching on it. So you're getting you're getting that seventy two T top, but with a hmm. A, a very unique neck pickup in that set in that it is a hot neck pickup both in the coils and in the magnet. It is a very bright pickup also. So you get kind of a rare combination of hotter coils and also a very bright sound. Hmm. And uh, I mean, we all kind of know what, what... J, JP post 72. Oh, sorry. The preset is, is same neck pickup in both. Pre has the PAF and the bridge. Post has the T-top and the bridge. Exactly what it sounds like. In okay, 1972, got it, got it. Jimmy Page swapped that bridge pickup out from the PAF to the T-top for reasons uh, of probably nothing other than it failed, and it was just the pickup of the time. Holy crap, this goes on forever. <laughs> 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 okay, well, let's see. Let's see if we can... You don't have to go through all of it. <laughs> Well, I kind of want to because you okay. know it's it's like you, you know here's the thing. I mean, um, your favorite one will be at the bottom, maybe. <laughs> uh, a greeny burst. I think we all kind of understand that one a little bit. You know, just yeah. Probably. So it, it's basically one of the pickups is a, essentially a PAF that's been rewound with the wrong kind of wire and by hand. And they're also out of phase with each other. And so yeah, <laughs> there you go. And the Bloomfield. Super Sessions. Uh, Fillmore Sound. Love it. Uh, th that is just what you would think there. Just uh, Mike Bloomfield's burst sound. It uh, sound, sounds really nice to that twin reverb back there. Nails what's, it. What's Mario's dream set? Okay. So th the other author <laughs> of my book, Mario Milan, who um, yeah. he, he's the more established author at the time he wrote that for sure he's um he writes for guitar magazine and uh in italy and uh had written another book that's a set that he had sort of come up with the concept for where um there are two different spools of wire but the the coils are otherwise fairly similar and it's an a4 uh magnet in that one so to just sort of break it down to basic like feel and eq um it's a lower output set than the a4 paf ones still very uh Woody, but a tighter and brighter version. Not not as chewy and thick and, and rich as complex as the uh, the PAF ones, but a little bit more of a, a brighter, tighter thing going on there. You ever think of making less pickups? Yes. <laughs> well, the 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 plan is probably to um, break down to about four or five humbucker sets that are stock just standard and they probably will be and i'll welcome feedback from you guys and anyone else here what they probably will be is the 57 the creme brulee the paf1 a4 and the 1960 a5 i don't know if i want to do the 58 or not it might it might just be kind of hmm. and i think what i'm gonna do is those stock them so that there's less of a wait time 
So those are the popular ones. And I think that if I had to go down to four, that would cover the widest range of ground. And then the other stuff's all going to be like special order. Right. You know, that makes sense. Things. So that, By the way, can you guys hear me? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For some reason, my video has gone like walking. Yeah. 15 seconds into like behind you guys for some reason, but as Where's long as you can, as long as you can hear me, that's you, all. you look good to me. Like your video is synced up with your audio. You disappeared for just a few seconds and then we're back. Okay. All right. Yeah. It looks fine. All right. No problem. Uh, JDB set. John Dillo burst, or it could be John's dark burst. So John Dillo. Hey John, if you're watching, it was a, uh, an early customer of mine, super cool guy who used to come by my shop in Frederick all the time and just hang out and like real chill dude. And he has a Les Paul that has a problem, which is not at all uncommon. And that is that no matter what you put in it, that neck pickup is mud and dark and chewy. Oh yeah. And the bridge sounds weak and thin and brittle. And it, it takes that I come across that in, I don't know, one out of every 10 Gibson USAs and, and maybe one out of every 15 or 20 Gibson custom West balls. It's, it's not uncommon. And it's the, the muddy neck is probably the most common complaint I get from pickups, not from mine, but I mean like people calling looking for something. So that set addresses that. If you've got one of those problematic guitars that no matter what pickup you put in it, the neck is always muddy, it's chewy, and you think the guitar is just a dog and you want to get rid of it, that might fix it. Now, the downside there is that I can't sell you any sound of PAF that I offer and have it also address that problem. So we can address that problem successfully or if the guitar, if, if you don't like the sound of that, that type of set where you have a really bright neck and a really warm bridge to counter that acoustic nature of the guitar and bring it back into balance, well, then you might have a dog and maybe you need to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, probably, huh? Yeah. High offset humbuckers. I think this, yeah, more single coil jangle, basically. There you go. That's exactly what it sounds um, like. The coil's much hotter and it, it does take a step in that direction of a single coil. That's not a PAF replica. Neither was the, the JDB set. Um, it's just uh, inspired by, but addresses a certain particular thing. If you want to do split coils, which, which I don't really like, but if you're one of those guys, you got to switch and you got to use it. Like if you're that, like that set yeah. will do it because you don't get a big drop in bass and volume when you switch to one coil if you use the hotter coil. So it's nice for that, but it's a compromise. That's always a compromise. You don't get a, you don't get a big, fat, full, rich, thick humbucker sound in humbucker mode when you do that. So the VLO, very low output, and that's uh, it's a lower output version hmm. of the fifty sevens. Basically, it's 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 not a PAF replica either. It's kind of taking a PAF and then pushed it a little further into that extreme, uh, a little bit further than what you would find in range of a PAF there. So even even brighter than you would find in a real A3 PAF. Right. And then you have the VH Super Distortion. No, it's a Super Distinction, Dave. That oh, other name that you said Sorry. is owned by someone else. The Super <laughs> Distinction. I read too quickly. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely not that other thing you said. It certainly has nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's uh, the uh, ceramic magnet hex pole type sure. of thing and that, that's one of the pickups that, that pete used in his his shootout and did a really great job with and i i love it it's one of my favorite uh non-paf sounds mm. different than the later super distortions or yeah the, so i'll just say the the earlier demarzio pickup super distortions had more variance between them and also sound different than today's and they use different parts too i mean i don't i don't think that they're even using the thick ceramic magnets or the brass base plates today although i could be wrong i still use the brass base plates do they okay yeah, that's a demarzio thing i have a bin full of early square leg 70s ones and they don't even use the same kind of wire some of them are like a purple plain enamel some of them are <laughs> hvf and so they they do sound different. <laughs> and uh i picked uh picked one that i thought captured that sound that that sunset 1978 sound and went with that and I, I think it came out well. It's got a little bit more clarity and a little bit more richness than what you might find in a typical modern similar style pickup. Right. And then, of course, the VH2. Yeah. That one is uh, it's a hotter pickup. 
Um, that one's got an A2 in it, and I'm not married to the idea that that album had an A2 magnet in it. And I don't, I think it can work with it or without it. Kind of like we talked about earlier, different pot values and what speakers you may be. It, it's not necessarily there's several paths to the same destination, but there are several effective ways to approach a similar sound, and none of us are Ed. And oh. so it may or may not work. But I, that pickup to me, captured that sound and so what that is is it's essentially a paf using a coil pattern that i found on a lot of early santa barbara pickups and and pafs that were repaired in the 70s in santa barbara to, mm -hmm. if that covers what i'm trying to say yeah and basically the coil pattern that i see on those is a very tight and precise pattern that allows you to stuff in more wire than would otherwise fit in the bobbin. So it's not like anything magic. It's it's a very very full bobbin of wire mm -hmm. done by evenly winding the coil precisely, evenly and tightly. Yeah. And so if you, it's kind of similar to the, that greeny pickup. It's a PAF that's been rewound, and that's that's the sound I get there. Right. All and right. Well, that's a lot of pickups. So now we've confused everyone. Now let's go to the P90s and the Telecasters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll be here all night. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Um, I didn't Mark even go there. <laughs> <laughs> Humbuckers. Yeah, like Strat pickups. Hardware. We've got a question from Mark G. Uh, yes, James, when you are winding a new pickup set, do you prefer to eat chocolate or red velvet cake? Okay. Ah, it's a cake joke. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's an inside thing from a Les Paul form. Uh, my Les Paul form. So uh, wow. I, to be honest, I'm, there, I don't know. There's a like a re ongoing revolving joke about cake there. Personally, I, I'm a pie guy. I, I, I'm more like pie over cake. Not that I'll turn down a cake, but oh, you see, I'll, cherry I'll, pie, I'll, apple pie. I get birthday pies rather than birthday cakes. Okay. Um, so how much, how much are the pickups? How much do they cost? Uh, the, the humbucker sets start at six fifty. That's yeah. That's, that's a boutique price. They're, they're not the cheapest option. They're not the most expensive option, but I, you know, I don't, I don't think that I, I the way I, Calculate my pricing is basically just my materials, my time to do it, and the amount of money necessary for me to just not do something else for a living. I mean, they're not for everybody. And it, it just pricing is so personal and specific. If it's if it's a lot of money or if it's not a lot of money, it varies a lot from one person to another. So they're just kind of priced what they are. And you know, it yeah, uh, it is. It is what it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to tell anybody that like they sound three times better than a pickup that costs a third as much, although they do. But I don't really try to push anyone into that. They might not. It just depends. It's all case by case, and it's all in music. It's all preference too. Like what what's better, what's worse. It's it's very personal and subjective, and highly right. dependent on on other things. Right, right, right. Gotcha. So, how'd you end up writing the book? Um. Okay. Yeah. Uh. Let's go to that. Touching back on DC resistance that we talked about a little bit earlier, I had written an article called The Misleading Nature of DC Resistance regarding guitar pickups. And it was basically what we talked about earlier, saying how you might have a a 9K pickup that is brighter sounding than a 7K right. pickup, but most folks are going to assume the opposite. And so it was just sort of an article explaining that, giving some examples of different coils and how you might end up in that situation where you've got low, <laughs> lower reading pickups that that are warmer and fatter sounding than brighter, but then uh, then higher reading pickups. Um, sorry, the other way around. Higher reading pickups that are brighter and fatter sounding than lower reading. And that Mar Mario had found that article, Mario Milan, the other author of, of my PAF book, and reached out to me and said, hey, you know, I, I have this other book and do you want to collaborate? I like your writing style. And, and so we did. We worked on it. It took a couple of years and we got a, a lot of other industry guys involved. I, I didn't 
want it to be just like my opinion or my take on things. And so there's input from um, John Gundry and Bill Magella and, you know, other pickup winders, even uh, Mr. Dave Stevens. And I don't even agree with all of it, but the idea was to take a collection of information and about these things and put it out there. And we, um, we also got some contributions from the Gibson Museum regarding photos and info. And as a huge plus, like the thing that I think is the coolest about that book is that when we went to the publisher with the final drafts, um, and it's it's Hal Leonard, Center Stream, the music publisher that does a lot of the tablature and other guitar type books. The, um, the editor came back to Mario and said, hey, I've had this like in this interview sort of in my back pocket for a long time waiting for the right place to put it and your book is the right place and what that interview is, is it's the last interview that ted mccarty the ceo of gibson during the burst years had given before he passed so oh, that's wow. published exclusively in that book which i think is just so cool <laughs> oh, cool that is great uh, i understand mario milan is in the chat is that right hey mario i love you brother ciao <clears throat> i don't see him but someone mentioned, yeah, there he is. He said, can I say hello to James right there? Oh, wonderful. Hey, Mario. Grazie. Ciao. Very nice. Very cool. So where can people find that book? Because I was looking at Amazon and they have it for $388 there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what's going on? It comes with one of my pickups at that price. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, you can go right to CenterStream anywhere that Hal Leonard or CenterStream books are sold. So Barnes and Noble, um, Amazon, I guess uh, the publisher might be out. They have been back ordered regularly. It's been a popular book, so they'll they'll publish a batch and and then it gets sold out. And I think that's probably what must be happening to see that price on Amazon right now. But yeah, yeah you, you can buy them direct from Hal Leonard. Go to their website and there's a, a shopping cart and a link there. You can buy it from the publisher. That's cool. That's very good. Um, let me see if there's other questions. Yeah, there happened to be um, a lot of pickup companies that popped up over the past few years. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's it's yeah. been a lot of companies that have popped up, come and gone for a million years. True. You know? True. I'm surprised I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Pickups. 12 years you know usually us pickup guys just take a lot of people's money and disappear or, or you know start doing drugs or fall off the map in some way or another it's not a not a great reputation for reliability in my yeah there's been a few of those day. that i can think of yeah <laughs> have there been i haven't run across any of those but yeah thankfully well, uh there great. was uh, some guy uh, i remember a bunch of years ago pete had some pickups from uh wb pickups or something wade boggs will, or something will boggs, will yeah. boggs. <laughs> just vanished yeah so yeah. i got pickups of his to repair occasionally because he was you know another one of those like form sellers and so he disappeared and, and at some point i would get some coming back to me saying hey i got these and they never worked to begin with and sometimes there was no wire on the bobbins or no magnet in it i, I now other times to, just to be fair i have heard some like really nice sounding pickups of his um bill landry has a, a really nice set Mm -hmm. But I, I think uh, towards the end, he started falling apart and was just shipping out like anything in a box to make it happen. Because, I mean, some of these things never could have worked like without a magnet in it. It just it, it never could have worked. Mm -hmm. huh. That's horrible. Yeah, a lot of there, there were a lot of guys who did that kind of stuff in the Van Halen building community. Uh, you know, they would build say, oh, I'm going to build you a guitar and then disappear disappear exactly or yeah. they or they you know you keep waiting for your guitar two years later it's um, a hard guitar to build that's why i didn't build that one I, that's you know I, I build guitars but just to do the stripes right and to get oh, yeah. like the things that are wrong right and in a guitar like that it's important to get the things that are wrong right it's i think it'd be easier in fact i i know it's easier to just build like a telly or a strat replica than to try and copy like any iteration of Oh yeah, it's tough. Your Ed's guitars, they're all like so unique that it's one of those things like we've done projects like that where you shine a projector with an image of what you want to copy down on the workbench. Like I did that for the um, Greeny Burst pickups. I had a customer that wanted the covers aged just exactly 
as oh, they really? were in this one era. And so like that's a really rough cover. They're they're just really, really beat up. That's probably one of the most aged pickup covers I've ever looked at. So yeah, shine a projector down on the workbench and then kind of replicate that as it's shining onto the piece. That's that's what you'd have to do, I think, to really get one of those fan right. hailing yeah, guitars. Exactly. Right? Like that that level of detail matters in that project. And I didn't have the time for it, so I bought mine. <laughs> yeah, I, I I hired some. I got somebody to build my fifty one fifty because there's no way in hell I would have the patience to sit and relic that thing the way that they that they do. Well, what's know. your Explorer behind you, Mark? Is that a Destroyer? No, it's a it's a Gibson Explorer. Is it? Yeah, I, I wish I could find an. It's like finding a left handed Destroyer. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> that really hard. I've I've actually never seen an Ibanez. Uh, any of those 70s you know copies from in lefty um yeah. they're they're tough to find uh, I'd, I'd like one like that the, those look nice yeah they're sweet yeah that you know they're really nice actually epiphone just came out with uh their versions of the explorer and the um the flying v and the, you know in, oh, never mind sorry what's it what was that go ahead no in karina they were you know and but the epiphone models are like 13.99 now oh really yeah it's like wow an epiphone for 13.99 it's not Co it's, korean karina for that's what they 13. say is it really karina I mean, come on. but uh, well what what was the uh the the uh destroyer was some other karina looking wood right it, it wasn't actually karina uh, Japanese uh, sen, sen uh, right? Yeah, ash, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah. That's, Pete, that's Pete's good. got one. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he's got a great yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. yeah. He's got a good one. Sounds good. It, it sounds great. That's a sound I don't have in my lineup of guitars. That I'll have to address that at some point. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I have to say, I'm just gonna call it out i hate this comment i really do i you know i get it uh no hate i, I know but it's it's like bro that you know i didn't do it wrong because i it's just what comes natural to you you know everybody when you're playing an instrument it's there's no rules anybody who tells you that there's rules they're wrong there's no rules as long as you're making it sound good and who gives a shit whether i'm playing it lefty or righty um it's it's natural that's the way it's just natural I, I when i did air guitar when i was 13 years old i picked up a, a a tennis racket and held it like a lefty right that's way before i ever picked up a guitar yeah um it's just natural that's just the way i play well say so uh, maybe you should just played a right-handed guitar lefty and been like air you know like Eric Gale style, you know. I could have done that. Strong the opposite way and play the riffs opposite. Play, yeah, I could have done that. That's true. <laughs> uh, are you are you right handed in other aspects? And you only only, only or are you sports. southpaw all around? Only in sports. In sports. Um. So in sports, I I bat righty. I everything I do in sports is is righty, which is That's very strange. Yeah. Now with with your guitar electronics, do you use the reverse taper pots and wire them up so that they turn? um i guess that would be counterclockwise to increase yes okay yep i do that so i mean I, I well i don't necessarily buy reverse taper pots i'll just buy a regular pot and i'll wire it backwards okay do you like the taper that way i i, I ask because i have customers sometimes they just use them they use a regular audio taper pot and wire it in a what would be a right-handed way but put it in a lefty guitar mm -hmm. and then other guys actually want a, a reverse audio taper and wired up reverse of what you would put in the right hand yeah i you know interesting um, and i can do both yeah i would roll off really quick if you yeah that's what i was going to say mm -hmm. the roll off it just rolls off quicker that's all mm -hmm. yeah um so we it's so weird talking to you guys and out of sync like i can't even look at the camera <laughs> it, it looks good on my end okay yeah, it looks fine on my end too all right cool it's just so weird like i'm you guys are not responding to me like visually um so it's strange um let's see what else we got yeah someone said i never use audio taper for volume only tone hmm. 
Thanks, Scott. It's all yeah, I don't know. Personal. For lefty, I just always wired it differently, you know, backwards. Like put the lug lug to the to the pot. Yeah, reverse. You know, one thing that gets overlooked a lot with taper of pots is that as you increase compression, gain, saturation, you're squashing the taper and it changes. So when people are like, I don't like this taper because it responds this way, it's like, well, into what? Because yeah. the more compression you have, the faster it's going to come on. And then the less range of adjustment you'll have at the end. So, you know, if you're playing into like two metal zones stacked into a, a tube screamer into, uh, you know, a Soldano, you almost have a switch instead of a pot. But if you're playing into that twin reverb back there, then it's an entirely different experience with the same guitar. Right. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I see I, that. Yep. I can see that. Um, the, <laughs> someone wants to know, do you make lefty pickups? Yeah, I can wind them backwards, but if you're in Australia, you need to let me know because then I have to wind them backwards and also backwards and upside down. <laughs> and a day late. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, very cool. I'm just scrolling here. Uh, any other questions that you have, Dave? I think we covered a bunch of pickups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you make P90s. Oh, um, about, gee, then there's the whole Strat set thing, and that's a whole different story. Jesus, I didn't even look at this. Uh, there's got to be tons. Primarily, I'm making Gibson and Fender style pickups. Um, I've messed oh around my God. with Filtertrons and Gretsch stuff too, but the, the, the One, big sellers two, are the... three, four. Oh, you're looking at the tellies. So, seven Strat, different Strat eras. Oh, the Strats, yeah. I'm not even a Strat guy. I, I appreciate guys that can play like I just can't get those sounds like Jimmy and Stevie out of a strat. I they I make them sound awful. I love them. I keep a strat around. i I'm building a couple Mary Kays. You didn't see them. They're just sitting in my in my closet. See, I don't need to drink. I can just inhale the nitro fumes. But <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really wanted to do an, a Mary Kay burst. I just like that finish where it's like that, oh, beautiful. that that opaque white around the edges and then translucent in the center. Um, but yeah, I, I like strats. I like to just hit an open F chord and, and wiggle the bar and, and do it through you know one of the reverb amps and just take in that sound. But I can't get like a good rocking sound out of one just because it's me. I, I, I don't have it in me. A telly makes you fight it, but then it pays off. A strat makes me fight it, and it doesn't pay off with my hands. Yeah, I just I'm just not into a bridge strat pickup. I'm just not into it. It has to have a humbucker almost. Man, I had years ago. I had Lindy Frail and Wine Me. I had a long time ago, early '90s. Wine Me, a uh, uh, metal base plated strat uh -huh. bridge pickup. And the prerequisite was I was, I said, make it as hot as you physically can with a certain wire. And it, it, it was a plain enamel wire. Okay. Not, not the form. Bar. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. It was a form bar wire. Okay. And uh, I don't remember what it wound to at the time. The form bar. I don't know more what magnets it was either. So. But I think it was taking his uh, vintage hot uh, pickup and just winding more. And then I also had him kind of double wax dip it. Okay. So. But you didn't and, like it in the end? No, it sounded great. Oh, it did? Okay. It was awesome. Lindy's cool, man. Lindy. Yeah. I, I basically said, can you make a strap pickup that sounds a little more like a PAF? But this is before he did like the later things where, where, where it was like P90-ish strap pickups and stuff. Mm -hmm. This is really early on. A, a strap size format is hard to work in because there really just isn't a lot of room there. Yeah. If you, you want to get into using two coils, you know, that's when you get into those like little thin blades and very, very narrow coils. And yeah, just because no. no matter what you do with that pickup, it, it's in a narrow space. You're not getting a lot of harmonics. You're getting a lot of fundamental, and so it's always going to sound kind of kind of stiff. I think. 
It was good. Yeah. That's cool. Hey, John Martin, um, you bought that burst bucker off of me and, and you love it. Great. I'm glad to hear that um, from our vault show. And, uh, I, you know, I've sent out a bunch of stuff. I never heard from a bunch of people who I sent out this stuff to. So I assume you got it and you were happy. So um, and thanks, everybody who bought stuff from us. That was that was a fun show. We'll do it again. I still have the ricochet pedals. Do you still have the Jose? Yeah, I still have the Jose too. Oh, you still have the Jose. That didn't sell. <laughs> no. Well, it it could have sold, but not for the price I wanted. Uh there you so. go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh the, the two people that said they were buying the two ricochet pedals both backed out. Oh wow. We and of course, even emailing them a hundred times, just go, could you just let me know you don't want it? Yeah. Still no response. I know. I, I had the same thing. I had the same thing with I one mean, of my... I, I don't care that you don't want it. I don't care at all that you don't want it. I, I just would like to know you don't want it because I think probably there it was there might have been some other people that you know could have offered it to at the time. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, Joe, uh, Fraylin's work is outstanding. I've always liked uh, Lindy's stuff too. So he's and he's a, and he's a nice, super nice guy. So super nice. Yeah, he was like the you know the the grandfather of the well, not Duncan, I guess would be, but of boutique pickups. Fraylin probably was. He was right across the river from me when at my first yeah. shop location in Frederick, Maryland. And so we had a lot of similar customers and he did work for shops that I worked for. Always had great results. You know, very, oh, yeah. Maybe like very timely time. service, very fair price and, and mm -hmm. good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Really good stuff. Awesome. Well, look, James, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank yeah, you for right. having me. My goodness. I'm, yeah. I'm no, it, it's absolutely. Uh, yeah, awesome to get to know you and learn learn about not only you an author, but you're also uh, got great uh you know great products to to look at and, and to purchase. So definitely, guys, check out his website. And uh, again, it's a Rewind Electric, and um, and also check out Sweetwater. And uh, oh, I want to give a shout out. I'm going to be on a um, there's a, a podcast. Uh, it's a YouTube show. Uh, and also a podcast called the Rock and Roll Research Podcast. Um, I saw this through through my industry that I work in. Um, that another researcher uh, in the healthcare industry uh, has a rock and roll podcast. Oh, so cool. I, yeah, so I wrote him. I said, "Hey, you, yeah, that's that's so cool. Uh, another person in my industry doing this." So. Um, so he invited me to come on his show, which was fantastic. So I, I said, I'd love to, so I'll get a chance to talk about my career a little bit. So guys, check out his, um, this guy's show, uh, his name is Matt and, uh, it's a rock and roll podcast, uh, and rock and roll research podcast on YouTube. So check that out. I'll be on awesome. that in the next few weeks. So, and then we have to book our next guest. I think Dave and I, will, our next show will be, uh, probably an ask Dave show. We'll probably do that in the next couple of weeks. Very cool. Always learn a lot on those. Uh, oh, hey, for for your uh, your viewers, I, I made a show, made a show here. Sorry, I'm not Cantrell. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see the back? Sure. I don't know. Can you see it there? <laughs> also, not Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. That's awesome. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. Great. Oh, that was great. <laughs> um, Jim Cox has a question. Uh, some art auctions I watch make folks send PayPal before the show ends and they can't bid on other items until it's paid. What is that? It's mean? hard to keep up, man. Oh, I guess he's referring to the, um, the paying the, the, the auction yeah. show with the gear that you guys did. Yeah. Oh, the, the, the sale, the gear sell off. Oh, yeah. No, nah, we're not going to make, uh, you know, I, I, it's going to be real, like, just the way we did it before. So it's easier that way. Uh, and then TKT Audio says, seriously, James pickups are so good. I don't want you to go buy them because the more backlog he gets, the harder it is for me to buy more. But if you want to be blown away, rewind pickups. 
Very we, cool. We've there had, you go. We've had backlog issues, but um, part of what I mentioned earlier about breaking down things into four or so core sets and then having other stuff of special order is going to greatly reduce that. Right. And I appreciate everyone who's had patience with with me. I'm, I am essentially a one-man show, and I definitely taken on a lot more than i can handle in some ways but we're getting through it we're getting and through now it. unfortunately you have more yeah. yep <laughs> well keep, keep them coming because i know a guy with the jose that might look nice over there oh boy <laughs> uh joe alba uh mark i'm in the software consultant industry with experience with ehr work we got to be in the field to pay for our guitar gear hobby that is for sure that is for sure. If I was going to rely on the YouTube show, I would be homeless and have a lot of gear. So, um, <laughs> I wouldn't, <laughs> but yeah, I wouldn't, I would not be able to pay for much if I just counted on the show. Um, Hey Joe, reach out to me, by the way. Uh, I'd like to hear more about what you, what you do. So that'd be cool. Uh, James, again, thanks so much for coming thanks on. The so show. Much. Oh, and, thank you guys so much. Truly an honor. I mean that. Yeah, no problem. No problem. And uh, again, guys, check out Sweetwater. Check out fixpedalboards.com and follow our Facebook page and uh, Instagram. I'm on click Instagram. subscribe if you and haven't. So, yes, click subscribe and the like button and all that stuff. Also, I've been doing uh, shorts of the show um, and kind of some, some special features. Like I did a tour of my, my room here uh, recently um so check out you know make sure you subscribe and you'll get get to see some of these like you know kind of newer content that i'm doing and dave's gonna also send me uh, some videos also some short videos that i can upload like a tour of maybe his studio and stuff like that yep i just gotta remember to do it yep yep no problem <laughs> I'll, I'll remind you um all right guys have a great weekend all right see you guys later yep James, just hang on one second while we say goodbye. Gotcha.